So I'm three issues in that Bondus NA oversized format, Brian Hitch, uh, Kevin Nolan Inks, and it is, it, it's, I, it may be the best Superman idea I've ever had. Welcome to the Comics Cube, everyone. Today I'm rejoined by Mark Wade, and we've got a lot to talk about. How are you? Good, sir. How are you this afternoon, evening, mar- morning, where you are? I don't know. This day. Um, yeah, this day. <laughs> this day's been. Uh, this day's gonna go okay. Um, I'm gonna start with a one question everybody wants to know about because sure. Uh, because this is up in a couple of days. Tell me how you got involved with Impossible Jones. <laughs> Carl Kiesel is a dear friend of mine. I've yeah. been a dear friend of mine forever. And he's been kickstarting and successfully, you know, producing over crowdfunding this book called Impossible Jones. It, the first edition came out a couple of a couple of years ago, last year. Again, time has no meaning. I don't know. But it was really good. And so he asked me to, you know, help him sweeten the pot this time for uh, you know, give it give, you know, each each level a different sort of reward and Ask me if I do a, a six pager for him, and I'm happy to. Any anytime Carl needs me, I'm there. So the six pager you're doing right now, it's a three pager for even Steven, who Carl describes as a cross between the Phantom Stranger and Mr. A. Yeah. And you're good, writing one. Yeah. yeah. You're writing one of his origins. It is currently a three pager. At the moment, it is $86 away from becoming a six pager. And how, uh, how, what do you think of even Steven? Oh, I think it's a really cool character. I think it's, it's, it's even the whole gimmick is that he fights you on your level. He has the magic ability. He just dressed like a black and white crisscross black and white business suit, sort of like a zebra uh, alternating black and white on, on, you know, so forth, but it's hard to explain them over the, the air, but uh, his magical ability is that he can match you power if you've got superpowers he will match you exactly in those powers if you if you come at him with a with a gun with four bullets on it he can magically magically materialize a gun with four bullets in it so he, he wants every fight to be fair because he needs to prove for reasons that you will find out he he needs to prove that good will triumph over evil in a fair fight so everybody go to impossiblekickstarter.com because i would love to see a longer version of the story three pages not enough not enough not enough. And uh, you're drawing that with Don Chicago. Don Chicago yeah. is drawing that for you. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Um, you have been announced as working on a Superman Black Label book with Brian Hitch. This is not the first time you're working together. How'd that yeah. come about? I think everybody knew last year when, you know, stuff changed. We were all like, oh, Mark Wade's going to come back to DC and do Superman. And- oh, yeah. That, I think got approved the, 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 the afternoon of the event. Yes. The afternoon of the, you know, of the regime change it had been in the works for a while i i can't go into a whole lot of detail about the story because i don't uh, you know dc hasn't officially announced it yet it basically just brian just started throwing stuff out there um but a few years ago one of the editors came to me and said i'd like you to develop a superman black label book i said no so what do you mean i said I'm not interested because it'll never get approved no, no, no. I'm sure I'm, it's black label. I'm sure it'll be approved. It'll be fine. Nope. You must have a Superman idea. Nope. Don't have a Superman idea because if, because if I ever thought I would be able to write Superman, I'd have an idea. I'm not going to write. Wore me down. She, Molly Mayhem wore me down until I finally came home and I'm like, not going to do it. And then wouldn't you know, I came up with the best Superman idea I've ever had. So it sat in, you know, I, I did the pitch. It got, it, it got approved to every level until the publisher said, not interested. Uh, Brian Hitch signed on, still publisher not interested, but uh, we kept uh, hope alive. And so the moment it was, you know, the moment the regime change happened that day, like that, that project was greenlit. So I'm three issues in that Bondus NA oversized format, Brian Hitch, uh, Kevin Nolan Inks, and it is, it, it's, I, it may be the best Superman idea I've ever had. And you, okay. And uh, what's it like working with Brian again? No, oh, it's great. I mean, it's it, it, Brian, 
Brian brings the thunder when it comes to the action stuff. And in fact, as we did, with, as we ended up doing with JLA near the end, uh, I, I entrust a lot of the choreography to him more so than I do with, uh, with some right with some artists who actually want or need more direction with Brian. It's, it's more like, you know, Superman and Luther, you know, are in this giant fight and here's what has to happen. And then you figure out that I'm not giving him, I'm not giving that to him because I'm burdening him with it. It's because he wants to do it. He wants to, or a lot of times it'll just be, instead of me saying panel one, panel two, panel three, I'll just say here, here are the panels I need on this page. And if you want to add, subtract, move things around, you know, feel free. And he's, he's great about that. He's a great collaborator. Brian Hitch is, um, you know, he's one of, I feel like one of the most influential superhero artists of the last 20, 20 years. Right. Yeah. Like how, like as somebody who grew up, you know, um, in the silver age, how do you feel mm -hmm. about, the way that Brian Hitch has completely changed the way costumes are drawn. That's I, I, I'm totally fine with it. I mean, the thing about it is he, he never loses the humanity of the characters. And that's the important thing. I mean, it's, it's, he does the bombast. There's no confusing a Kurtz one page with a Brian Hitch page. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. But there is still a, a deep love for the material that he has. I mean, the reason he signed on is because he said, I was born to draw this project. This is the, this is my ideal Superman project. Great. So yeah, I, I have nothing but good things to say about Brian. Is it different working with him on a team book versus a solo book? Not so much. I, the big difference is that at the time we were doing JLA, we were sort of, we were in different directions. I was, I tended, I was tending to write more uh, character driven stuff, smaller stories. And Brian was, you know, had just come off the authority and then off the JLA, Heaven's Ladder Heart, you know, the, the tabloid. And he was very much about the big spectacle, which is great. But we we were not like peanut butter and chocolate at that moment. So we were good friends, but we decided, you know, we decided this, this, this partnership is not working at this time. But that was, you know, almost 20 years ago. Now we got it, you know, now we got it licked. Awesome. So you're, you're doing much less uh, tighter scripts, I assume, for, for Brian yeah, this time? Exactly. And, and what's it like working with Kevin Nolan again? I, I, again, love Kevin. I don't know, I don't know that I've ever worked specifically with Kevin on a project that I've written. I could be wrong. I know I've hired him as an editor a couple of times, uh, but he does such a beautiful job with Brian's pencils. I mean, just such a beautiful job. It's very solid. Yeah. Um, you're yeah. also announced to be working on a Batman Superman team up uh, with Dan Mora. Yeah. Uh, How did that come about? It's again, regime change, dude. <laughs> regime change, phone rang off the hook all day. Um, very flattering. It, it, I, again, they haven't officially, officially, they've announced that we're doing a, a 10 page story for Detective Comics with Superman and Batman, World's Finest. And it's no secret that that will lead into something. Uh, the exact shape of it is still only about 80% um, solidified. Because the, the, the problem is, I just have so many ideas for what I want to do. And it's, we have an approach, we have, you know, we have a guaranteed place on a schedule, it's a go. I can't tell you more about it in part because I still have some stuff to figure out. We're still a little ways out, but the, I, the basic mandate is give us a bread and butter Superman, Batman comic. Give us the classic versions of the characters that we all know and love and don't feel beholden to continuity in the moment. Uh, don't make it, a, you know, I mean, I don't want to make it a nostalgia act. I mean, that's, that's, and frankly, that's the challenge. I don't want it to come across as, you know, me trying to recreate the silver age or anything dumb like that, or it's that I'm trying to do, um, that I'm trying, again, that I'm trying to make it a nostalgia act. It's still got to read like a contemporary comic, but um, giving me access to the characters in a, a more classic form, that boy, that, that just sweetens the, that just sweetens the whole deal. Why do you think, uh, why do you think people, why do you think people see you as a Silver Age throwback guy? Because even when you were writing The Flash, that's what people were saying. And I'm like, yeah. this is th these stories don't read like Silver Age Flash. Thank you. 
thank you. I think part of it is because 90% of those people have never read a Silver Age comic and don't know what it is. But beyond that, I mean, I don't know. I think, you know, in the 80s, I started out going against the or 90s, really started going against the grain. I mean, it was everybody else was doing big image comics, tight inspired stories and big doom and gloom and cynicism. And I just don't write like that. So, you know, Flash went in very much the opposite direction and that sort of set the tone. I, I mean, I do like playing with the toys. I think that, I think the fact that I'm, it's well known that I'm an, an expert in DC history and certainly in the Silver Age in terms of knowing that stuff, I don't think that helps my reputation. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's, that's, that's a question. It's hard for me to answer. I'm more interested in why other people, I am more interested in other people's answers, although you don't have one. So I don't have one. Cause I don't think you're a silver age throwback. I don't think I'm a silver age throwback either, but it's, I just, I, I, I want, I, I could easily be, if I wanted to be, mm-hmm. I could easily be, but it, I mean, that would be like falling off a log. I could write a comic book a day if I were doing that, but I don't want to do that. Even JLA year one, Silver Age characters, but I think with a much more modern sensibility and a much more character driven sensibility. So, yeah, it was weird because uh, back then, uh, Grant Morrison was, I think, he, I think Grant, I, I think they are more of a Silver yeah. Age throwback than you. And it, in, a, in, the, in the big ideas way, yeah. I mean, that's the thing about the Silver Age, it, you know, more so at Marvel than at DC, but still at DC, it was all about big ideas. It was all about big stuff that we hadn't seen before, which is really hard to do now after 80 years to do things you've never seen before. So when you're talking about the classic versions of Batman and Superman, hmm. at, this, at this point, what does that mean? To me, it means, uh, you know, Superman with a secret identity who doesn't have a son and isn't married. And that... Again, none of that is a slam on the Superman of today. None of that is an indictment on the books. I love Son of Superman. Like that's a that's a cool book. Um, but it's just I I personally can't connect emotionally to that version of Superman. So I'm not saying this is the way Superman should be. This is the way Superman ought to be. I insist that this is my version of Superman. No, it's just a version of Superman, but it's one that I can connect to. And same with Batman, less so with Batman, because less has changed with the character, but it's still, you know, a guy in a bat cave and a giant dinosaur and a, and a penny and a Batmobile and a bat signal and stuff. So the toys that, and, and Wish Robin, honestly, I'm not sure where we are on the timeline yet. So I'm trying to figure that out. Well, all the Robins look alike so much and all you have to do is show a Robin and let readers decide. <laughs> And let readers decide. Yeah. <laughs> but what about their dynamic? Because at this point, you know, classic Batman, Superman, you know, the Silver Age had them getting along like chums. Um, yeah. And, and then Frank Miller showed up. And, but that was that was also nearly 40 years ago. So, right. That could be classic now. So what's the yeah. uh, what's the what's dynamic? The friend? I mean, I mean, that they're more interesting to me as friends, because for 30 years or longer, we have seen them be at odds. The concession since John Byrne came along was that, uh, you know, because they're so different, you know, they, they tolerate each other and they're kind of friends, but their differences are bigger than their similarities. And I reject this. I, on two levels, one is that I think that, I think that their similarities are so strong, you know, and I wrote to that in kingdom come. I mean, again, when you scratch the surface off of both of them, all, you're left with somebody who doesn't want to see anybody else die. You know, that's their that's their number one priority. But beyond that, I also reject that interpretation just because I've seen it for 30 years. And I would like to I mean, it doesn't mean they're going to be sitting down having ice cream cones together. And that's not what I'm saying. They're not going to go to the beach and hang out. But I do think that and they're going to have their differences. But. They both are adult enough to know that there is no purpose for them being enemies and there's no gain in them not being friends. The world is a better place when they can work together as friends. That's just, that's undeniable. I feel like there's a life lesson here to be learned between people (laughs) with differences. Yes. There's there's some, (laughs) but somewhat. Yes. Um, What do you think of uh, John Kent being bisexual? I great. I mean, awesome. I think that, 
my frustration is that people immediately jump to, oh, it's publicity stunt, blah, 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 blah. It's not. I mean, to say that is a disservice to the creative people who are working on the book. Um, that it got publicity does not make it a publicity stunt. A publicity stunt is when the marketing and, and sales department comes down and says, you know, we need an event. We need this big thing to happen. How about this? And then editorial plays along. This wasn't that. This neither was, you know, truth, justice, and a, and a better tomorrow. This was simply a matter of, no, these are the kind of stories we feel like telling or we want to tell in the 21st century. And it would be criminal of DC as a corporate entity to not seek attention for the things that it publishes because that's not its, its job is to sell comics. Uh, so you can't, I can't be frozen that. But I think. You know, I think that's great. I think that that Superman, in part, was always popular and always stood for those those kids who felt alienated or or othered or unappreciated uh, or bullied, and they saw in Superman again. They were they they saw I'm Clark Kent, but inside I'm a Superman, and so is he. You know, yeah. and uh, how can that not apply to the LGBTQ community? Especially for it to be a, a young character. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, it's a hard for a lot of, you know, middle-aged white guys to, to understand, but dude, you're not the audience anymore and your comics are still there and you could read every Superman comic ever published if you wanted to up till, you know, 1999 or whatever. And it would take you, enough time where you could then circle back and reread them and you know over the so there's plenty of them out there just not every comic is for every reader and i just don't understand the the backlash of hate except that it is it is driven largely by bigotry and in part something yeah, and to be generous sometimes it's driven just by cynicism of oh it's a publicity stunt and again i'll tell you as a matter of fact, it's not a publicity stunt. It's something that DC and the writers and the creators and the editors felt was time to do. And it meant something and it was going to mean something to people. So I'm all for it. That's a really long answer to your question, but there you go. It's great. I'm curious about this because I work in corporate. So sometimes when we do something big, we do a press release. And yeah. I know for from experience that not every press release gets picked up in, in mass. Right. You, it was a slow news day. If anything else had happened that day, on a, on a big, if, 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 you know, Afghanistan were still, you know, overrun with refugees trying to get out, I don't think that that would have made the headlines. You know, DC, as you say, you know, DC and Marvel can put out all the press releases they want, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's not up to them to decide who publishes that. Yeah. Or how that news gets out. But I got to say, whoever was working in, in uh, marketing that they earned their keep. They did. They did. Yeah. Although, although again, just, and I know, you know, this, I just want to reiterate it for the listeners, not a marketing driven stunt. Yeah. I, the only time I can think of a marketing driven stunt is probably when they, um, when Marvel insisted on extending the clone saga. Yeah, that's one. Um, and every once in a while, I mean, events, you know, big, Intercompany events, intercompany events are are often you could call them marketing driven. I'm not sure they're publicity stunts per se. Crisis on Infinite Earths was not a publicity stunt, but it was certainly done with an eye towards how do we get more attention to DC Comics. Okay, uh, you know, I'll, you know, less so at DC, more so at Marvel. You know, accounting will come down the hall once a year, and they go, okay, well, we need a big sales bump this month, this month, and this month. So, what are you going to do? And then it becomes, all right, well, maybe we'll, we've been thinking about an, an, a crossover here. Maybe we'll do a crossover or an event or whatever at, in April or whenever accounting needs that to happen. So that, you know, it's not to say that marketing and sales don't sometimes drive the bus, but they don't creatively. They just say, I mean, nobody comes down the hall and nobody from marketing, no one from marketing comes down the hall and says, hey, I bet if you made Iron Man gay, we'd get a lot of... Uh, a lot of hits out of that. So a lot of clickbait. So you should make Iron Man gay. That doesn't, that's not how it happens. What happens is marketing comes down the hall and says, we need something to push. 
because we're coming up on an event or we're coming up on an anniversary or we're coming up on a special date or, or sales comes down and says, you know, we need, uh, you know, more profit in the second quarter. And that's how this stuff happens a lot of the time. What is your preferred finish to this phrase? Truth, justice, and blank. I'm perfectly fine with a better tomorrow. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. I, the American way will always be in my head because it has been forever, but that wasn't from the start. You know, it was yeah. tacked on with, it was tacked on for the radio show when we were in World War II. Specifically when, you know, it wasn't even originally on the radio show. It was just when we got into World War II, they tacked on the American way, same as the phrase under God became part of the Pledge of Allegiance in the 50s because we were fighting those, those pesky communists. Um, and I don't, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. I know Tom King used the phrase last year in his Up and Away graphic novel, but I don't think I need the fingers of both hands to count the number of times I've actually seen that phrase used in the comics. So have you ever I, used it? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think you've ever I wouldn't, used it. I mean, it's not because I don't, you know, it's not because I have anything against it, but I get it. It's not, it's not a denial of American culture. It is an expansion of the idea of Superman. It is, you know, it is making it clear that he's not just a hero for um, the United States of America and, and, put, and pushing just the United States ideals. It's pushing humanity. It's pushing humanity forward. It's for humanity. It's a character that belongs to the world, and that's an acknowledgement of it. And uh, the thing that I think might blow a lot of people's minds is even after the radio show, after World War II, they changed it to tolerance. It was truth, justice, and tolerance. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And in Super Friends, it was truth, justice, and global peace. Truth, justice, and, and peace for all mankind. And peace I for think, all mankind. Maybe. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's all, that third one has always changed. Yeah. Um, I didn't ask you about Kingdom Come last time, so I'll ask you 25 years later. How sure looking back at Kingdom Come, how does it feel? I feels good. I mean, it's I I know no matter what I do for the rest of my life, that's what's going to be on my tombstone. So, um, I guess I'm I'm good with that. It's a it's a good story. Alex is brilliant. The the, the thing looks brilliant. I have written better stories since. Um, because I'm 25 years better at my job, but there's nothing I look back on and regret. I think we, I think we did a, a, a decent job. Of, I think I did a decent job. I did Alex knock out of the park. I think I did a good job. Um, and there's nothing I look back on now and go, Ooh, I wish I'd done that different. I feel like that's the work. I mean, I know that Marvel's is technically what put Alex on the map, but I definitely know from experience that that's where the name Alex Ross just started popping up all over the place. Yeah. And, and a huge part of that is your story. You, ch you changed it from his original proposal. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I, you know, we, we worked on it together. We hammered it out together. And then I went off and, and scripted the thing. And it, it was his basic idea of, you know, what if Superman retired and a bunch of younger heroes, you know, and, and it's narrated by, you know, the, the older priest who was Alex's dad, actually. Yeah. Um, but the rest was, okay, we, that's, a, that's an idea. It's a series of ideas and some awesome sketches. Um, now let's come up with a plot. Let's come up with a story around it. So I don't want to, I never want to oversell my contribution to the project. It's, you know, without, if it had been drawn by anybody but Alex, nobody would care. But oh, I don't know I'm, I'm happy with, I don't know, I'm happy with what we got. I do look back and go, the one thing that's missing from that story um, is comedy. Like there's just, and, and I don't, the dead man sequence is the only one that's actually even remotely funny. And the rest of it is just dour, dour, dour. And I don't mean I would do it different. I think I would do it differently now. I think that, I don't know, I wouldn't change anything, but it's, it's so unusual for me to look at my own work and not see any, any comedy in there somewhere. Even in the darkest story, I always like to try to keep you on your toes so that you never know from page to page whether I'm going to go funny or whether I'm going to suddenly yank the rug out from under you and go really dark. Don't let the uh, the fans of a certain direct uh, DC director hear you say that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit back to the American way. How do you feel about people saying something like, um, now that they're taking the American way out, they're going to change Captain America's name to just Captain, which they've already done. <laughs> yeah, which they've already done. It's... It, baloney i mean it's just it's 
first off, no one's ever going to change Captain America's name. It's not repeat because it's not a repudiation of America. It is instead a recognition that Superman's values are global. Superman's Superman's mission is a global mission. Um, if you change Captain America's name to just Captain, then that would be sort of a, a no stumming to. I can see how somebody would read that as a sort of an unpatriotic act. That's because that's who Captain America is. He was born here. He was bred here. He's he fought for us in World War II. He wears our flag. These are not things that apply to Superman. In 1996, when you were writing Kingdom Come, you said that um, you had a hard time writing Wonder Woman. Has that changed over the last 25 years? Nope, not a bit. <laughs> still hard. I just, it's still hard. I don't, and it it's a great character. I mean, that's, you know, this is, again, not an indictment of Wonder Woman. Awesome character. It's just that I'm not a mythology guy. I'm a science guy. Mm -hmm. And was always a science guy growing up. And so I myths and legends and fantasy and flying dragons and Game of Thrones and stuff like that, just complete blank stares for me, not any interest on, on my uh, on my part in any way. So it's hard for me to connect in that way to that character. And I think if you're going to write that character right, you've got to embrace that stuff. It. Also, back then in Wizard Magazine, they ran a poll about what do you think the greatest comic book ever is? And, you know, Kingdom Come came in at number two. And what came in as number one? Dark Knight Returns. Of course. Yeah. I'm okay with it. Yeah. And then third was Watchmen. Okay. Wow. Okay. All right. Then they're wrong, but it should have been, that should have been number one, but okay. I'm, it's it's, it's nice interesting to, in to me that in a moment that at that moment in time, you yeah. guys were considered to be better than Watchmen. Right. It was that stuns me. I'm that's amazing. Um, three stories here. Yeah. Uh, the Flash Neuron story where he gives up his marriage to Linda Park. Yep. Spider Man's Brand New Day. Yep. And Superman 2000. Yep. There's a common thread here, but it's a different ending for all three of them. What can you talk about what, uh, how important keeping them, keeping these couples together is for you? Or, or not sure. together or not together. I mean, I think that, in, I mean, you know, what we're referring to is in, in flash. I think I can't remember where the flash came first or the Superman 2000 pitch came first. I want to say flash came first. Flash it came was first. flash came for good. So it was, you know, the idea that in order for good to triumph and to beat the devil, Wally and Linda have to make a deal that their love no longer exists. They still, they still know. I mean, it's not, it's not one more day. They were still together. They were always together. Nothing about their history changed. They just looked at each other and felt nothing, which was the greatest sacrifice I could think of. In fact, I had stolen that from a Batman and Robin idea I'd had, where I thought that Dick Grayson, that would be Dick Grayson's greatest sacrifice if he no longer cared about the Batman family. Um, so that's one iteration. Superman 2000 is a slightly different iteration where we, you know, Grant and I thought, that's the way to sort of repair the marriage of Superman, and which was still fresh at the time, and and put things back to a Lois who didn't know who Superman was, um, which at the time I thought was very important. As time has passed, and I realize it's been you know almost thirty years they've been married, I I can't justify undoing that marriage anymore. It's what people know. It's what people grew up with, and so I would. You know, I mean, one of the reasons I'm not writing a Superman monthly comic in current continuity is because if you handed me that, I wouldn't want to undo it. But at the same time, it, I don't feel connected to it. So, um, so there was that. And then Spider-Man One More Day is, there were, if you look back at my Flash run and that run of Spider-Man, You'll see a you'll see many similarities. I'm sure it's coincidental, but you know the Spider Force and the Max Mercury character and the, the the you know the one more day forgetting deal with the devil and stuff. I'm sure it's coincidence, but I'm I'm amused by the similarities. <laughs> and then you uh, writing Spider Man afterwards. Uh, did you ever have a particular if you if you had written Spider Man? on a regular basis, instead of just part of the brain trust, would you, would you have pushed a particular love interest? 
Not really. No, I don't. I I don't know who I would have found. I don't think it would have been MJ because I think that that's just too perfect. I think that my my issue with the Peter Mary Jane romance and marriage has always been that for Spider-Man to win, Peter Parker has to lose or vice versa. That's like that. If you're not, if that's not in your Spider-Man story, you've written it wrong. And so it, the fact that Spider-Man ends up married to a hot supermodel and the love of his life and everything works out for him. I, it just doesn't feel very Peter Parker-ish to me. Yeah. That was always my thing. It's like um, spider for me, that's the end of the story. I get that they're supposed to be together. Can you tell me about uh, working on the Amalgam books? Yeah, that was a lot of fun, actually. This was to set it up for the readers. You know, DC and Marvel did a big crossover uh, fighting each, you know, DC versus Marvel. And in the middle of it, the conceit was that both companies stopped publication for a week. There were no Marvel comics. There were no DC comics for that week. There were just 12 comics that were, six were produced by Marvel, six were produced by DC, but they were all under the Amalgam label like they'd always existed like there'd always been a series called super soldier which was a, a mashup of superman and, and and you know captain america or you know i forget the other ones but yeah that was yeah jlx, Claw, was, was JLX. Just, yeah jlx was just league and x-men that was fun i mean that was a lot of fun to get in the to get to work with dave gibbons first off who i got to work with it's been a, a, a dream of mine to to someday prove to Dave that I'm good. Um, <laughs> and I'm not just, you know, some fanboy. So I, I don't know if I'll ever get there, but I'm trying. That was a lot. That was a blast. You, know, you look like you guys were having a lot of fun. What was the impetus for some characters being complete match, you know, mashups of, of other, of two characters? Well, some characters like super soldiers, Steve Rogers, who finds, the the rocket from krypton and then gets turned into super soldier so like what why were those the differences it you have to remember this is 30 years ago or close to it right it was 20 years ago i don't remember it's it's been a while and i don't really remember other than the fun of it was just you know we're putting marvel and dc together in a blender what can we do to smash these things up all we i think that you know how do we get green kryptonite and the red skull together we got green skull you know, it's just a lot of it. The, one of the best pieces of advice I ever heard about writing was uh, from David Ogilvie, who was an account, uh, ex- an advertising man. Da- um, Ogilvy and Mather were one of the companies that the Mad Men, you know, yeah. the company was based on. Uh, Ogilvy and Mather came up with like the Marlboro Man. They came up with, you know, very famous advertising campaigns. And Ogilvy once said, the best ideas start as jokes and he's Mm. absolutely right. That is absolutely true. One is because a joke will arrest your attention, but also because the key to a joke is that it's unexpected. And that's the, so the best ideas are the unexpected ideas, the ones you don't see coming. And so I thought building the entire amalgam universe on basically an extended joke, no, the mashup joke was just fun. That's awesome. <laughs> um, can you tell me about uh, your? Uh, can you tell me about working on the history of the Marvel Universe with Javier Rodriguez? What yeah, an artist! Was, oh my god, the guys it is brilliant. I mean, br- just brilliant. Uh, talking about bringing the thunder, it was. I that was a deceptively difficult project. When it was first offered to me by Tom Brevoort, I thought, "Cakewalk." I know this stuff, and he even gave me a list of here are the things we want to cover in every issue. So it's, it's, you feel like it's right there. It wasn't all there. Um, the more I dug, you know, the, you know, the more I realized my comprehensive knowledge of the Marvel universe kind of petered out around the year 2000. And there's been not only 20 years more history, but 20 years more retcons to the stuff I already knew. So, so I'm learning all about the Eternals and I'm learning all about, you know, this and that and, and, and so forth. And so it was a, it was a huge learning experience. Uh, the Inhumans. Yeah. I mean, the, the Inhumans insanely convoluted backstory. Um, but, you know, we, I think we did a decent job with it. We could never have done it without the research team that Marvel had. 
they're those they're the they're the people who put together the appendix to every issue, the one that basically covers you know in more detail the things that we had put forth, and also covered the things that we were not able to get to because not everybody can be in that book. It just there's just no room. Um, and there were times when we got really close. We almost accidentally left out the Falcon. We almost accidentally left out Black Widow. And that's this is how much stuff was in that book. That it's it's it, the enormity of it is such that you could actually forget about Black Widow as you're putting it together. So we got that's huge. We caught that in time. Yeah, we caught that in time a lot of times. But I don't think there's anybody huge that we that we weren't able to touch on. So um, the challenge, of course, was writing a, a history book from the point of view of Galactus, who knows our our future, and yet I don't know our future. So. <laughs> You know, the conceit was he's coming up, he's, it's the end of time, he's beginning to dissolve, he's beginning to sort of discorporate into, an, into the energy that will create the next Big Bang. And so as he gets closer to the present day, things are starting to fade in his mind, he's getting more disparate, he's getting more, you know, dissociated. And so we threw in some clues to the next year, a couple of years worth of Marvel stuff. Some of it is stuff that I asked other writers for, and a couple of them were things that I just threw in just the fun of it, just Stephen and Bay would pick up on. Nobody has yet, but there's time. How did you even script that for Javier, though? Because there are some pages in it where I'm like, I don't even know how I would describe this. It, it, you know, I didn't. I just said I, it, it, he's so good and he's so design oriented. It really was just on this page. You know, the secret empire, you know, on this page, Spider-Man doing whatever you want him to do. And so just. Wow. I just told I just told him what who and what needed to be on the page. And as far as the design and choreography, that was 100 percent him. And it was just, as you know, I mean, it was mind blowing. Yeah. The, my favorite page in the entire book is when he's doing the origin of Spider-Man and mm. it's in, in Spider-Man's foot is at least angled so that his foot is coming at us in extreme foreshortening. And he uses the you know the the webbing the 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 squares and the webbing to be the panels of the of the story i think that was just great mine is uh when it's the splash page of the thunderbolts and it's a cracked glass and it's yeah half the thunderbolts and half the masters of evil i'm like yeah uh, this could have gone wrong in so many ways <laughs> yeah but yeah. it worked it could um, have been very dry it's, it was still a little dry i mean there was just i you know in a perfect world if i'd had like a year I might have been able to find a way to write it in more of a less less linear, more um, more contextual way, but I didn't have a year, and there's a lot of stuff there. So, you're one of the most successful, most critically lauded uh, writers of all time, and I think a lot of fans uh, see comics as a writer driven work. Mm -hmm. How much of your success has been driven by the fact that the art has been driven by the fact that the artists you've worked with have been amazing. I, the majority of it, the majority of my success. I mean, again, I, I have said over and over again that if you like Daredevil number one, I can list for you a dozen artists who are good, but if they'd drawn it, nobody would pay attention and the book would have been canceled by issue 12. Um, you cannot ever, as a writer, underestimate the need for an artist and a storyteller who can do the job and do it well. It's a collaborative medium. And I get in this argument sometimes with, uh, with writers who, when they do create their own stuff, they're like, well, I own 100% of the character because I came up with it. Well, bullshit. I mean, first off, even if you did, even if you designed a costume, I don't know, it's still the artist's job to interpret that into a story. And if you, does, if you as the writer are not willing to, to surrender to the fact that the artist has a valuable contribution to this. And it's like a, you know, I don't, you know, 50, 50 split in terms of revenue and ownership and stuff. I don't know what to tell you because you can have a brilliant idea that you own hundred percent of, but if no one looks at it because the art sucks, then it does you no good. Can I, I know we're out of time, but can I ask two last questions? Yeah. yeah I get, I'll make it for you. I'll make extra time. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, after we spoke last time, you said that you had a whole thing about Carl Burgos' robot characters. And yeah. I've always been curious about what you were going to say. Well, sure. I mean, you got, you know, you have the Human Torch, the robot. You yeah. have 
you know, the Captain Marvel of the Silver Age, the, the one who said Split and Zam. Um, I know there's another one in the mix somewhere. And I, I, if I gave it a moment's thought, I'd think about it. But it's just funny to me that that's, and I know when he did a couple of stories for Silver Age Marvel stuff, like human, like Johnny Storm, Human Torch or whatever it was he was doing, there were, there were robot characters and android characters in there. I just think it's an interesting insight into, into him. I don't know what it says, but it says something. Maybe he was a robot. Maybe um, he was a robot. I don't know. Uh, we started this off signal boosting uh, a, a small press comic, Impossible Jones. I would like to end it by signal boosting another one, um, Gene yeah. Ha's May. Absolutely. Oh, my God, Gene Ha. I mean, again, what talk about brilliant artists I have worked with. I mean, Gene is is one of the five best artists I've ever worked with. And really? His, yeah, what are the five? Oh, well, because he's a thinker. I mean, that's, that's, that's the thing. I mean, I've worked with a lot of great illustrators, but Gene thinks about the story in a deep and meaningful way and has questions and has thoughts and, and you know, wants to know why this happens and why this happens and wants to talk it out. And that's great because you, you want that. I mean, he's a, he's a thinking artist. And, every, and when you get a thinking artist, what that means is that every line on that paper has a purpose. Every character standing around has a purpose. Every action a character takes has a purpose. It's not just because every gesture, every expression has a purpose. And it's not just because the artist felt like drawing the character in that pose or whatever. No, Gene has a reason for these things. And his creator own book, May, M-A-E, is terrific. And he's done two volumes so far, right? I mean, mm-hmm. um, I was fortunate enough to be tapped to guest write one of the one of the issues. I was very happy with the way that came out. And I was very honored that he would ask. Um, but if he's not, if he's doing another one and I don't know about it, let me know. And this is the time to let the whole world know. Yeah. He said that um, uh, he approached you to write a story about May's sister, Annie. Mm-hmm. And uh, you said you'd rather write about May. And then on the air, he said, you're, you're f- Mark Wade. <laughs> <laughs> write whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he overestimates, but yes, it was. It was a great issue uh, though. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, those are my questions. Uh, maybe we can do this again when uh, your Superman stuff is officially announced. Yeah, when when things get officially announced and stuff gets rolled out, yeah, drop me another line and we'll we'll find some more time. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Mark Wade. Take care, sir. Take care.